Okay, let's talk about uh, community ecology, chapter 54. And so here we're talking about the assemblage, the mixture of various populations of different species living together in a particular area um, and interacting with each other. Um, these kinds of interactions we would describe as interspecific between species interactions and they come in various forms as you can see here competition predation herbivory various type of symbioses um, these interactions between species can be described as being positive for one or negative for the other or positive for both or having no effect and so, for example, competition between species is where they are both having a negative effect on each other. Um, this is where they're not necessarily eating each other, but they're perhaps competing for a shared resource. So, for example, hyenas and lions um, don't really prey upon each other much, but they compete for the same food sources. And so, in that way, they are having a, a indirect or a indirect effect on each other. Um, this competition can sometimes lead to what's called competitive exclusion, where one species outcompetes out competes the other. Um, this was famously studied by a Russian scientist named Gauss using paramecia, and he discovered that they had a very similar, they grew under very similar conditions, and different species, when you grew them in isolation, did just fine, but when you put these two species together, one was a better competitor than the other, and the one died out and he's the one that sort of developed this idea of the competitive exclusion principle. Um, and this is related to the ecological niche, um, which is the uh, total of all of the forces that impact that species, all of the living and non-living things that impact that species. Um, you can think of it as its ecological role, um, you can think of it as, as kind of the job it has the environment, where it lives in the environment. The one definition I've heard that I kind of like is it's sometimes described as the multi-dimensional hyperspace. It's that place in the environment where an organism lives and encompasses all the factors that impact that species, the multi-dimensional hyperspace. Um, it's often wondered why ecological communities can be so diverse um, because as Gauss showed, if you have two species that occupy the same niche, one tends to outcompete the other. Uh, well, why are there so many species? And it's thought to be due to what's called resource partitioning. And that is species, not consciously obviously, but in order to minimize competition with other species, they tend to specialize their niche. And so these uh, lizards here, for example, some live lower down on the tree and on fences, and others live higher up in the tree. Um, they have a similar niche, but they subdivide the environment somewhat to, again, avoid competition. And there are some there are several species listed here. You can see there's some that live on the ground and again others that are higher up. So the niches, the, the habitat is divided into different niches which allows coexistence between these species and minimizes competition. Um, and you can imagine how evolution would select to minimize competition because competition has a negative effect on you. So if your uh, way of doing things, if your niche can s change slightly um, to minimize that competition, that would be a good thing. Ecologists like to talk about what they call the fundamental and the realized niche. The fundamental is the niche that the species could possibly or potentially occupy, all of the space and conditions under which it could live. But then you often have the realized niche, which is more constrained and smaller, um, primarily due to competition. Um, so here's a good example with these barnacles. There's two species here, Chalinus and Balinus. And this is the intertidal zone, and this is on the northern west coast of the United States. And so you've got low tide and high tide. Um, so 
you can just look and you see the species that it lives down in the lower areas of the tide and this lives in the higher areas and so you think okay well this one clearly favors this area and this one favors the lower down area well when you do the experiment of removing one or the other if you remove chalonis they don't show that here but what happens is balanus just kind of stays down low it doesn't really begin to creep up higher and you say okay that's because this guy likes it down lower well curiously when you remove balanus these bluish ones the other will expand its range it can actually live throughout the tide line but it normally doesn't because of competition with this species thus this species realize niche is more constrained in its fundamental niche where it appears at least in terms of these two species this one it's fundamental and realized they're kind of one and the same in regards to challenges when you remove it it does not expand now there could be some other factor that might allow this to expand but in terms of competition between these two species this one is kind of it's fundamental and realized are about the same um, this um, competition can uh, and, and niche and resource partitioning and niche specialization can lead to what we call character displacement and this in particular happens when you have species really living in close contact with each other and that's what's described as sort of living sympatrically they live together in the same area as opposed to allopatric and these this is when two populations two species don't really live together so for example here are two species of, of finches that live in the Galapagos Darwin's infamous finches you can say on this one island you only have this one species and its beak size encompasses this range on Daphne a different island you have um, this other species and its beak size encompasses this range and you can see there's a lot of overlap this one you know it's slightly larger sizes but not much and there's a lot of overlap well, on these other islands these two species live together and you can see this one um, the kind of brownish orange one its beak sizes shifts down to be lower and the other one becomes larger that is there's character displacement this character is modified or displaced or shifts when these two species are living together sympatrically to uh, presumably avoid competition or there's selection for them to become in one case smaller size beak in one case larger size beak to avoid competition you make it say okay what the heck difference does beak size make well in these birds it's very related to what they eat um, when you have larger beaks they tend to eat bigger seeds that need to be cracked open and smaller beaks eat plants with smaller seeds and so you can see when they're allopatric they probably are eating similar things but on different islands but when they get together they begin to specialize and this one starts to specialize on smaller seeded plants and this one on larger seeded plants um, to avoid competition so predation one species eating another one species benefiting and one species not benefiting because it's being eaten um, of course predators have all sorts of adaptations for catching prey as is listed here and also being able to run fast like a cheetah or something like that um, but of course prey species are not helpless in this this uh, interaction they have ways of avoiding predation by hiding or running fast living in groups um, having defensive mechanisms like a, think of a porcupine which has this spine to stick out or a, a, a turtle that has a shell um, and so and there are various ways to avoid predation uh, as well cryptic coloration or camouflage comes in handy you just kind of blend in and you sit there and hope you're not seen um, you can also and this is what's called aposomatic coloration you can really stand out these these poison arrow frogs are a good example of this um, they're sort of advertising that they're not very tasty and so you don't want to eat me um, Mimicry is also a common thing we see out there where you have species that, um, in case of what's called Batesian mimicry, you have a harmless species that mimics a harmful one. And so this is the snake, and this is a moth. 
And so birds who might like to eat a moth but avoid a snake will see this and think, oh my goodness, that looks like a snake. Um, but it's a moth that's sort of uh, posing in a particular pattern to make itself look like a snake. Um, Eulerian mimicry is one where you have actually two uh, somewhat dangerous or unpalatable or species you don't want to mess with tend to mimic each other and so they sort of ride on each other's coattails. This bee and this yellow jacket have a very similar look and so species in general just learn not to mess with them because that look means I'm going to get stung or whatever. Um, so, um, Batesian, there we go, there's that Batesian again. A harmless one mimicking a dangerous one. And Mullerian where you have two dangerous species mimicking each other. Herbivory, um, so this is when you have herbivores benefiting by eating plants. Um, now, plants are not defenseless in this. They, they have evolved mechanisms, spines in the case of cactus, cacti for example, um, and certain chemical defenses. Uh, a lot of the compounds that we use or traditionally have used in medicine are compounds that come from plants and they're compounds that plants produce. They're sometimes described as these secondary chemicals because they're not needed for the plant to live like say chlorophyll which is a very important compound that plants need to live but these are chemicals that help the plant to survive in the face of herbivory. They make the plant less palatable or sometimes even toxic to eat. Um, and so we have made use of some of these chemicals for our benefit. Uh, the uh, manatee down in Florida feeding on the some kind of plant, underwater plant there. Symbiosis, um, you've probably heard of this, the close relationship between two species. Um, Sometimes a species interaction that's not beneficial. Parasites. Parasites live either on or in a host, and they're essentially feeding off that host. So they are benefiting, but the host is not. But again, it's a very intimate relationship, you might say. But then a symbiosis that's beneficial is we know as a mutualism, where both species are benefiting. Um, <coughs> And sometimes you have situations where one is very dependent on the other and other, other situation where they can live separate, but they can also live together. Um, so here's a good example of a mutualism. Um, there's this, this is in uh, Central America, I believe down in Costa Rica, um, studied extensively by a guy named Dan Jansen. This acacia plant, what's called the bullhorn acacia, has these big horns on it. And there's these ants that live um, on these trees, these small shrubby trees. And what Jansen did is he wondered, okay, well, what's the relationship between these two? How do they benefit each other? Well, the plant, you can see them just here, produces these little food bodies, these little nutrient bodies on the leaves that the ants eat. So the ants get home and some to eat, but he said, well, okay, well, what does the plant get out of this? We did experiments where he removed the ants from some experimental plants. He fumigated the, the trees, basically, and so monitored them over time. And what happens is these trees that have the ants removed don't do so well because herbivores come along and chew on them. Other plants begin to grow up and outcompete it, and they just don't do well. And so the ant benefits the tree by keeping herbivores away. If a herbivore comes and starts munching on this, the ants swarm on it and start biting that herbivore and it quickly decides this isn't worth my time and leaves. And the ants also go out around the plant and essentially mow down the other vegetation. So they're essentially, this is their home and they're taking care of it. And a very nice example of a mutualism. Commensalism, um, interaction you may not have heard about before. It's, it's one where one species benefits, and the other, as far as we can tell, does not benefit from the interaction at all. Um, this perhaps is one. These are water buffaloes in Africa, and these are birds that hang around these water buffalo. 
And as far as we can tell, the water buffalo really don't benefit from the presence of the birds, but the birds just hang around because as the water buffalo walk through the grass, bugs are stirred up out of